everybody. I'm uh, Elliot Cohen. I'm the Dean of Johns Hopkins Science. I want to welcome you all to another edition of the Dean's Forum. Uh, today, our guest is going to be Ambassador William B. Taylor, uh, Vice President of uh, Strategic Stability and Security at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, before I introduce him, I want to just express uh, words of thanks to both the, the terrific SICE event staff, who as always are kind of masterminding things behind the scenes, and uh, to my friend, uh, Professor Dan Serwer, um, who uh, the Director of American Foreign Policy and of Conflict Management, who uh, arranged this and who, of course, is a mutual friend. Uh, as always, what, the way we're going to be doing things is a, I'll have a conversation with Ambassador Taylor, uh, and then we'll move into a Q&A. Um, you can begin putting questions into the Q&A. Don't use the chat. Uh, put questions into the Q&A as soon as you wish. Um, and I will try to get to as many of them as we have, uh, as we have time for. Uh, I always uh, privilege students at these events. So please identify yourself uh, by name, of course, but also if, um, uh, if, if you would, if you're a student, just say what part of the school you're from, uh, what you're doing here, and so on. So uh, our guest today is Ambassador William B. Taylor. Uh, last year, he served as the Chargé d'Affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, and we're going to start by talking a lot about that because, as you will probably remember, there was a very considerable uh, controversy around Ukraine involving the Trump administration. Uh, he also has a, a long and uh, extraordinarily distinguished record of public service. During the Arab Spring, he oversaw American assistance and support to Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, and Syria. Uh, he, he was previously the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine from 2006 to two, 2009. Uh, he served as the U.S. government's representative to the Middle East uh, Quartet, which facilitated the Israeli disengagement from Gaza and parts of the West Bank. He served in Baghdad as the first director of the Iraq Reconstruction Management Office from 2004 to 2005, and in Kabul as a coordinator of international and U.S. assistance to Afghanistan from 2002 to 2003. He was also the coordinator of U.S. assistance to the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. He's a graduate of West Point uh, and of uh, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, although he, I'm sure he much wished uh, that he had attended SICE instead. Uh, he served as an infantry platoon leader and a combat company commander in the United States Army in both Vietnam and Germany. And uh, Ambassador Taylor, welcome Welcome to SICE. It is such a, an honor to have you here. Uh, we're re really delighted. We have, um, we have a lot of SICE connections in common, as we were discussing earlier. My, my good friend and colleague, our distinguished practitioner in residence, Ambassador Eric Edelman, and a uh, former student of mine, George Kent, who also figured in the Ukraine tale. So welcome to SICE. So Dean Cohen, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. It is an honor to be here. And I want to echo your thanks to uh, Dan Serwer for, for making this happen. Um, uh, your, your comment about George Kent um, is, is apt since uh, he and I were side by side and in, in part, uh, part of that saga. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't know where he got the idea of bow ties, but probably I know now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, although like many students, he kind of passed his teacher long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Color. So um, what I'd like to do is um, ask a number of questions. I want to get to Ukraine. We'll get to, we'll get to the Ukraine issue. But you've had such a remarkable career. I thought actually I wanted to begin uh, with your military experience. You're a Vietnam veteran. Uh, so you, had a, you were a West Point graduate. Um, what difference did that make to you as a foreign service officer? I'm curious. So one thing it did um, uh, was allow me to understand the military. Um, uh, here, many of us in the, in the foreign service, by the way, I was never technically a foreign service officer. I was- uh, Really? The true, a little known, but, but, but true fact is- uh, Well, you're here under false pretenses then. I'm here under false pretenses. You can, you can terminate me right now. If, if, if I, no, I have, I have a checkered career as, as you've said, but uh, uh, while I was in the State Department for a long time since, uh, started under, under Rich Armitage, uh, but never actually as a, as a foreign service officer. But 
um, in answer to your question about the military, uh, like Rich Armitage, um, who had a military career, started out in the military. Of course, he went to the other academy. You know, he went. Um, uh, it allows me and others of us who served in the military to understand the, uh, a, a little bit about of the mindset. Um, uh, you get the other things. You get the understanding of the hierarchy and the, the way things work, and and the. The, you can picture you can picture combat in, in in my case you can you can picture the chain of command and those kind of things so there there are some those kind of things but basically the the what it gave me was the ability uh, in 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 uh, in particular in Afghanistan to some degree in Iraq but Afghanistan in particular um, uh, how it was on the ground and what we were doing on the on the foreign service side on on the assistance side. Um, was complementary to and and as a part of an overall policy. And if you understand both pi parts of it, both sides of it, having been in both, um, it 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 was helpful. Mm. You know, I, I uh, as you know, my my State Department experience is uh, modest, but I'm actually quite fond of the department. Uh, and one of the things that struck me, I'd spent my whole career hanging around with the United States military um, uh, when I, you know, uh, outside the university and. What, what struck me about state is both the differences and the similarities uh, between the two institutions. Of course, defense is huge, state is small. Um, people show up to work in suits, which is their uniform. But, but it also struck me that there were similarities. This was a hierarchical organization. I thought on the whole, a pretty disciplined organization, um, an organization that was pretty selfless. Um, I mean, do you see any of those parallels or do you, are you struck more by the differences between uh, the di diplomats uh, and, the, um, uh, uh, and the soldiers or the similarities? More the similarities, more the similarities. That is, they are, <clears throat> they are two institutions. Um, uh, and and like, like institutions of all different kinds, they have their their boundaries, they have their organization, they have their culture, they have their mission. Um, and, and those institutions, both at state and, and defense, and I was in the army, um, uh, give them a sense of, of where you are in, in that institution. And, and, and there are expectations. Uh, there are expectations of platoon leaders and company commanders um, and higher ranked, uh, and of, uh, of, of soldiers and, and you kind of know, this institution gives you a sense of, uh, of what your role is, what you should be doing. Institution is a conscience in some sense. State Department, there, there's a foreign policy institution as well with the same kind of, not, not the same discipline because you're right about that, but, but the same kind of, uh, of institutional framework uh, that gives you a sense of your role um, in an embassy and an office in the State Department as the Deputy Assistant Secretary, so it gives you a sense of, 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 of your role and what you're meant to do, and it keeps you within bounds. That is, the institution gives you some guidance. And is, again, I think it's a conscience. Uh, mm. it's, the con the, uh, there is, it's the conscience of, uh, of the society that, that, that keeps you as an in, in the institution of the military, institution of the foreign policy, world um, within bounds, within bounds of, of uh, what you ought to be doing. It's a conscience. You know, that's such an interesting, I, I, that, I don't think that's how people usually think of institutions, but I think you're absolutely right <clears throat> that, that they are this kind of, um, I guess the Freudians would say the superego, uh, the conscience that is saying what you ought to do. And of course, you know, the problem is that it's the institutions, which also then sometimes put you in a a position where the, you know, it, it is on the one hand that the conscience part of the institution says you ought to do thus and such, and your immediate boss says, eh, I want you to do this. And in a way, I think you, you found yourself a bit in that uh, position. Okay, so let's, let's uh, proceed to the Ukraine story. Let, let me stipulate that in this bizarre universe that we've been living for the last few years, um, all the time dimensions have changed. So the whole Ukraine scandal now seems 
like it was, happened about three decades ago. Didn't it? Have, wasn't it three decades ago? I thought uh, it was. Yeah. Anyway. It was sometime in my in my youth, right? Um, but, but obviously, it wasn't that. So maybe, if, could I just ask you, for the benefit of everybody who's you know completely exhausted by the latest set of tweets, uh, tell me this. Just tell us the story, would you? Yeah. So the story was uh, my my Ukraine story uh, began in two thousand six when I was asked uh, to go out and be the ambassador uh, to. Ukraine from the United States from 2006 to 2009. This is under uh, the same administration, uh, Dean Cohen, that you were, you were serving in. And, and, uh, um, and so it, that was a, it was a great tour for me. It was, a, it was a highlight of my career, I will say. Um, uh, to, to be charge, to be the chief of mission in an embassy like that at a time, it was, it was a great opportunity for me. Um, 2009, uh, as we know, the administration's changed. I stayed on a little bit under the administration, uh, but then came back and worked at the Institute of Peace. Um, fast forward, well, uh, not don't fast forward too much, but in 2014, uh, the Russians, of course, invaded uh, uh, and annexed, illegally annexed Crimea and invaded and then continued to foment problems in the southeastern part of, of, uh, of Ukraine and Donbass. Um, and from the Institute of Peace, I did some work on that and um, uh, but was kind of monitor. I had other responsibilities. It was not my main. Uh, so when actually I, I was asked to go uh, monitor elections a couple of times um, uh, in Ukraine, and that, that was a great opportunity for me to go back and see some friends. And, uh, uh, but that was about it um, until um, our friend uh, George Kent um, called me up. Um, and I observed there had been some turmoil out in the embassy. Um, um, and George called me up one day and said, um, Bill, hypothetically, um, if, if we were to ask you to go back out to, to Kiev as Sarge, what would you do? Hypothetically, sure, George. I, again, it was a great tour. I, I love Kiev. I love I love working in Ukraine. I, you know, we've got we've got a great policy. I thought we were strong. You know, a very good policy of support for this country is fighting the Russians. Russians have invaded them, and they're trying to defend themselves against the Russians. So this was this was a, a great opportunity. So I said, sure. I, well, about a day later, he calls up again and says, no longer hypothetical. Uh, would you be willing to go out there? So I said, oh, well, I better do some. Do some serious work then. So uh, did some checking, talked to my wife, talked to uh, some some of our mutual friends, been going um, uh, and got some advice. Um, and in the and one of the things that I was asked, it was recommended to me that I do is have a conversation with the Secretary of State. Um, and I didn't think that I was in the position to ask for that, but he said, uh, you know, if you're going to get support, if you if you're going to go out there, you're going to need support from the from the government. And the only way you're gonna know if you've got that support is talk to Secretary Pompeo. So I asked for, and then to my surprise, got a, got a, a meeting with him. I asked him about this, uh, the, the question that was on my mind, that is the strong support for Ukraine, the policy um, uh, that the US government has had for decades and continues and continued then um, was one I could support. And so if, and I told the secretary, if, if that policy continues, I'll go out. Uh, however, <laughs> he said, if that should change for some reason, you know, he's got a boss too. Um, and uh, if his boss tells him to do something, um, and if that something, if that change, if there was a policy change, uh, which I was worried about, um, I, I said to the secretary, the secretary, I can't be your guy. I, I, I can't serve out there. As, uh, and so I'll, I'll have to resign. He said, don't worry, I've got it. Um, uh, we're going to keep this strong policy, you know, uh, thanks for doing that, go ahead out. So I did. Um, not going into great detail, when I got out there, I loved being back. A um, lot of the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, employees at the embassy were ones that I knew, uh, having been there 10 years before. And it was a great, it was a homecoming, you know, I loved seeing these these people. And it's a, it's a great embassy. The Americans there are, are very competent, very dedicated. Again, it's a, you know, when you serve um, in, a, in an embassy in a country at war, um, it's different from most other embassies. Um, uh, and they have a mission. They have a, a sense of urgency. And there's a, there's a dedication 
um, and it was and it was uh, it was in, it was inspiring. So I I, I love being back. Um, however, partway through, and I, maybe we'll talk about institutions here again. Um, partway, uh, so I was there. But, so what we're talking about now is uh, I arrived in Kiev back in Kiev in June of 2019, so a year and a half ago, um, and. It became clearer over the summer uh, that there was a U.S. foreign policy that was strong support for Ukraine, militarily, diplomatically, you know, politically. Um, but there was this other something going on. There was what I, I eventually called it the irregular channel. There was another. There was another channel of uh, of policy making that was outside the regular channel. I, I was in the regular channel with George Kent and and the uh, embassies and and, uh, and and State Department and but there was another channel and it was outside it and it, this is of course uh, run by Rudy Giuliani. Um, I didn't know that at the time, um, uh, but it became clearer and clearer over the time over the summer. Um, in the middle of the summer, but in the middle of July, um, an order came down um, that shook the regular channel. It shook everybody in the regular channel and the order was from the, uh, from the President of the United States through the Chief of Staff to OMB to stop the assistance, the security assistance, the military assistance going to Ukraine. And in the middle of July, that's all we in the regular channel, that's all we in the trenches in some sense um, knew. That's all we were told. They just stop. Um, Hold, hold up that security system. Now, again, Ukraine's fighting the Russians. They're losing, the, the Ukrainian soldiers are dying at the rate, at, this, at, this, at that time, of two or three a week. So it's a hot war. Um, and this assistance is, is certainly useful for, important for uh, Ukrainian military effort, but it was also just a really strong signal to the Ukrainians that we're supporting them, that we're with them. Uh, that we, it's also, it was also a signal to the Russians. Um, that we're with the Ukrainians, and so that, it, it was very important. So, any any threat to that, or any any, any uh, suggestion that this was uh, not coming, this is security assistance, it's military. We're talking about weapons. We're talking about training. Talk about uh, um, all kinds of of, uh, of non lethal equipment, but as well as lethal equipment, lethal weapons. Um, this is this is was important. So when it was going to be cut off, that was a, that was a problem. Um, and this made me worry. This goes back to my concern that if this was if this was a change um, in policy, then I, I couldn't stay. I, I, and I told Secretary Pompeo that, and uh, um, uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton came out uh, about that time toward the end of August. I had a good conversation with him, told him the same thing, um, uh, and then as as we now know, um, uh, I didn't know at the time, but we now know that there was, that a whistleblower, a very brave man, um, uh, exposed uh, this phone call uh, that had taken place between President Trump and President Zelensky back in July. Uh, and that came out in, uh, in September. The full transcript was actually released in the end of uh, September. And we then got to see, um, read for the first time, um, uh, what had been what had been said, um, uh, and this irregular channel uh, had been evident um, in the request uh, that the president of Ukraine uh, do investigations of uh, of uh, Vice President Biden, Vice President Biden's son. The election in 2016, uh, this this kind of issue. There, there was there, there was that kind of uh, transaction. Um, um, it eventually, as I say, was exposed by a whistleblower. Um, that brought a lot of exposure, a lot of pressure, um, and and fortunately, um, that pressure resulted um, in. The reversal of the bad policy, the reversal of the hold on the assistance, and the assistance was allowed to go forward, and I didn't have to resign. Um, 
but I did get to tell my story. Um, uh, not, not that I wanted to, but I was asked by the Congress, indeed subpoenaed by the Congress, um, uh, to come, uh, and, and I did that, and that, that's a matter of public record. Mm. Um, so, in the course of that, I mean, various people faced various ethical issues, um, and maybe you can help us think through that. Um, or tell us how you thought through it. I mean, you know, at one level, public servants are expected to neutrally implement whatever the policy of the government is. Uh, you know, as uh, somebody who's seen a fair bit of life, uh, you, you know, you probably weren't entirely shocked that uh, there were some, some sorted quid pro quos uh, going on. How How did you tackle that, um, that point? When, when we first heard uh, of this directive, we first, first heard the directive to, to stop the security assistance, we all thought, uh, we in Kiev, um, but also our counterparts and colleagues um, in the State Department and the Defense Department and the National Security Council, we all thought it was a mistake we thought it was a garble. We thought it was a misunderstanding. And we were sure um, that we could fix that. Um, because again, I mean, this, the security assistance is, uh, is important for Ukraine, it's important for the United States, uh, it's important. That was our policy. That was, the, you said, you know, we know what the policy was. That was the policy. And it's been the policy that's endorsed by the Congress, it's been supported by all the administrations. So we knew what the policy was, and this was a change to that. And we thought, oh, must be a mistake, must be a mistake. Uh, so we just thought if we could explain it better to whom, whoever was confused, um, we would be able to fix it. And, and uh, the National Security Council um, at ever higher levels uh, had meetings to try to do exactly that, to convince the, the powers that be, you know, every level of the, of the national security structure that this is an important uh, component of US policy and that we should proceed with the security assistance. And it went up and up and up and up. Finally, uh, uh, Ambassador Bolton got it to the president a couple of times and there was still no, so no resolution. Um, and it was at this point that, um, uh, that uh, I was, I, I figured out um, in, about kind of the, in September that there was this irregular channel that it was outside. I knew what the policy was. The policy was strong support for Ukraine. Um, this, this irregular channel that is, as you say, you know, somebody tells you, you know, put pressure on the Ukrainians so that they will do an investigation of uh, a political rival. Um, you know, that's just wrong. Uh, that's not the policy. And I knew that was not the US foreign policy. Um, so I, made it my business to be in touch, to call on the phone, to send, it, send cables, to send emails, to have conversations um, at ever higher levels in my chain of command um, uh, to try to fix this, try to resolve this, this problem. A and again, um, if it couldn't be resolved, I was prepared to resign, um, as, I, as I had told the, the secretary, and as I had told John Bolton. Um, uh, Fortunately, it didn't, it didn't come to that. In the end, it was, it was changed. But, uh, but so I knew what the policy was. I knew this wasn't the policy. So I, that was not, I was not confused about, about which the policy was. Well, but I mean, just to press you a little bit, suppose, um, uh, you know, the president, you know, something that Secretary Pompeo had said to you, he, d he didn't, but suppose he just said to you, I know you think that's what the policy is. That's what the policy was. The policy is now put pressure on Ukraine to uh, help us get to the bottom of uh, the dreadful criminal doings of uh, the Biden family. So that's the policy. How would you have reacted then? I would have quit. And, and, and you would have quit because the policy was terrible, because it was uh, foolish, because it was immoral? All of the above. The way it was done. Or, I mean, I, I guess what I, what I want to get at is... Uh, and I, you know, I think any, anybody who is in a senior position in government, I've, I've always 
said, you know, needs to go into whatever the job is with a signed, undated letter of resignation. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully you never pull it out of the drawer, but you should have one. So I, I just wanted to see if I could just draw out a little bit more on wh what, you know, for Bill Taylor, what, what's the line you just don't cross? You just say, no, I'm going to end my diplomatic career rather than do that. So, uh, again, I had been pulled out of retirement in some sense. I mean, pulled back, back into the State Department um, with some trepidation um, and, and against some advice from people very close to me um, about not doing this. Um, but um, because I thought I could have some good effect, have some positive effect, both on the embassy and on U.S. policy, there was a brand new administration in Kiev. You know, Zelensky had just been elected, he'd just been inaugurated, um, he was brand new. And, and as, as you know, Dean Cohen, our, our role in many of these, em in, in all embassies and in, in new administrations of the host government uh, is, is important. And it's important to have the U.S. voice, the American voice there and, and offer support and offer guidance and, um, and, and an ambassador out there um, uh, helps him to do that. So. Uh, so I agreed to go out uh, because I thought, uh, the other thing was uh, um, Ambassador Ivanovich, my immediate predecessor, mm. Masha Ivanovich, was pulled out um, of, of her embassy, of the embassy Kiev, um, abruptly, uh, without explanation, um, uh, without a reason given to her, um, uh, and, and not only the effect on her, um, a real hero, um, for standing up for uh, anti-corruption work in, in Ukraine, a real hero, and that's why and that's why the Ukrainians went after her. That's probably you know we know that's why this irregular channel folks went after her as well. Um, so we we, we knew that uh, uh, that the ambassador Yovanovitch had, had been pulled out, and the embassy had been given no uh, no explanation either. So they were they were upset. Um, so again, I agreed to go back both for the policy reasons and to, uh, I was a known quantity as well, to many of the, of the Ukrainians there in the embassy. So I could have some, I could have some good effect on that. So I, I, I agreed to go out, but um, it was uh, uh, under the understanding, with the understanding uh, that this strong support for Ukraine, which I believed in. And again, me as Bill Taylor, um, I, I believe that it's in our interest to have a, a strong Ukraine. Um, and if, and if that were to change, then I, as I say, I would not, I, I could not represent the policy. And I couldn't represent the policy if, as in the hypothetical that you gave me, uh, Dean Cohen, that, uh, that they said that is the new policy, is to squeeze them to investigate the Bidens. Um, uh, that would be clearly too far. I mean, it would be, it would be wrong. It would be a change in policy that, uh, uh, that uh, is against what I believe in. So, so let me... Um... I guess, do you, would it have been any different if this had happened earlier and a similar thing had happened earlier in your career, you know, while you were still on your State Department cr uh, track, because uh, you, had, you had left state and you're being brought in. And so, it's, uh, you know, that's, it's, I think, easier to be, say, well, I'll, I'll go in if, I, if that's the policy I'm supporting. But let's say, you know, this had happened. I don't know, 15 years earlier, um, when, you know, you're, doing your thing at the State Department uh, as a career employee, would that have made any difference to you or you, you think it would have been that you would have drawn the same line? I would, I want to say I would draw the same line if the circumstances were the same. That, but um, um, if it was a change in policy back then, let's say my first tour, let's say, um, and it was a change in policy that, uh, that, that for, that the institution that the foreign policy institution that we talked about earlier, the, that is the, consisting of State Department and Defense Department and the National Security Council and you know, Treasury and USAID, if that, and Congress and, and academics and, uh, and think tanks and uh, uh, newspapers, um, if, if, the, if that policy um, uh, was very clear and I was given a, a, an order, no, change the policy, we're not gonna go after corruption, say. Um, a, a policy decision, um, or we're not going to, you know, we're going to do something different on on the way we're providing. You know, a policy difference. You know, I don't, I don't quit on. No, I don't feel like I had to. Quit. But, but uh, because it was, um, and if it had been in the in the hypothetical you give me, um, to 
try to dig up dirt on a political opponent. That's, then you still draw the line. I'd still draw the line. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sure I would. <laughs> I hope I would. I'm sure I would. So, uh, I mean, for the, uh, particularly for the students out there, this is a, uh, it's obviously a conversation about Ukraine, but it's also a, a deeper conversation about uh, professional ethics, particularly for people who go into public service. We were joking before I, I told Ambassador Taylor that uh, somebody once said to me that uh, we should have sweatshirts uh, printed out that say SICE on the front and deep state you on the back. Uh, but but the truth is the deep state, if there is, if there's not an American deep state, but uh, you know, the people who really are committed to public service often face these kinds of um, decisions. Let me actually, you know, go to a different case, not involving you, but just came out. So somebody we both know very well, uh, with whom you served, I believe, uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, who was the, uh, <clears throat> recently stepped down as the, I guess, the special representative for Syria. Um, Jim, a, a tough, crusty, also like yourself, a veteran, I think, a uh, veteran of the United States Army, which I think shaped a lot of his character. And uh, Vietnam. He, he and I are both Vietnam, in Vietnam. Yeah. So, I mean, you're very, uh, you're very, very similar in that way. And I think he, for him also, that left a kind of a stamp on the character, uh, quite a profound way. Um, uh, Jim had been actually signed one of the letters that I wrote uh, that, uh, you know, there's never Trumpers. Um, he, he has said he doesn't regret it. Um, but uh, he just gave an interview in Defense One where, he, among other things, he said, um, the, you know, President Trump had ordered a reduction of two, down to 200 troops, I think, in Syria, which is, I mean, that basically it's enough to defend an embassy, I guess, but it's not enough to do anything really in that context. And he said in this interview in Defense One, and I quote, and I'm assuming the quote is accurate, we were always playing shell games to not make clear to our leadership how many troops we had there. And um, you know, he made it his, his policy, his, his very, very strong view was that, you know, the United States needed to stay engaged there. Um, what do you think of that? Not, I'm not asking you to kind of rat out our friend, Jim Jeffrey. I'm, right. I'm just... No, 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 exactly. Exactly. No, that's, that's a, that's a, that is a hard one. That's a very, very, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with this. Um, I think it's important um, for decision-making purposes up the line in this institution that we talked about, both institutions, both the military one as well as the foreign policy one, to be operating on making decisions based on the truth. And the truth is we understand it on the, on the ground, in the field. Um, uh, people's lives are at stake. Um, people in Syria's lives are at stake. You know, uh, so I think it's I think it's really important. One of the things that was instilled in Jim and me um, uh, in the military is the importance of uh, of that information flow and the veracity of it. And you mentioned the military academy. We have a very strict honor code that we take very seriously um, for that reason. For the for the for the reason of how important it is in the military, but in other other institutions as well um, to be able to count on the truth. So I'm very uncomfortable with that. Um, now, um, if, so I think accurate information about how many troops are there, I think is really important and, and needs to be up there and needs to be, the Secretary of State needs to know it and the Secretary of Defense needs to know it and uh, presumably they did. Um, and if, if the Secretary of State, and Secretary of Defense, and National Security, if the institution evaluates these issues and, the, and these trade-offs and they decide, they decide, the institution decides, um, um, yes, with the guidance from the president um, that the number needs to come down to 200, um, I would want them to know the right, I would want them to know what, how, many, how many soldiers are actually in there. And if I couldn't live with it, I think I would, you know, Jim did walk out um, in yeah. the end. Um, I think he, I would have to do that. Others in that in that situation, left as well, um, as, yeah. as we know. So, uh, you know, I think you, you know, I think it's important to, to, ha to good information to going up and down. Yeah. Well, you know, the motto of uh, size of, of Johns Hopkins rather is uh, Veritas Vos Liberabit, the truth will make you free. And 
think one does have to be committed uh, to that. Let me, um, I'm going to step back. I'm glad to see we've got some questions coming into the Q&A. Let me really urge you to uh, begin putting them in there because in about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or so, I'll begin opening the floor up for, for questions for Ambassador Taylor. Um, this is an awful question I'm about to ask you, and I apologize <laughs> in advance. All right. Uh, uh, so this isn't the first terrible situation you've been intimately associated with, right? So you fought, you, you fought in Vietnam, you're involved in the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. We know how that one went. We know how Vietnam went. You were involved in Iraq, involved in Afghanistan. And you're, you know, you're, there you are doing um, uh, aid after, uh, for the Arab Spring. Uh, in which I guess your portfolio, you said, was Syria, Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia. So that would mean if you're optimistic about Tunisia, you're one for four there. Uh, these are obviously not your personal responsibility. <laughs> I, let me make that very, very clear. But, y you know, the, the serious point here is a lot of people look at all that and say, my God, what a record of failure of American foreign policy. Is that how you think about that? I mean, as you look back on a really an extraordinarily distinguished career where you act, you did a lot of good, uh, and of course, you know, I want to stipulate that, uh, but the larger policies look, don't look all that good. Don't I, look all that good. How do you think about that one? So I think about it one, one at a time, uh, one at a time. Um, Vietnam, um, here we were. Uh, young lieutenants, you know, we were 22, um, and and uh, we didn't know the, we didn't seriously know the, the, the geostrategic implications of this, or even the the, the national political implications. Of this. We we were we were young lieutenants. We were trained to to do what we do in Vietnam. I was in the infantry, so I was trained to uh, lead a platoon um, uh, in the jungle. So we did that, we, we followed our orders, we reported accurately up how many people we had. Um, uh, without, now, um, when I got back from Vietnam, um, uh, I actually volunteered to go uh, to flight school, uh, helicopter flight school, and helicopter flight school in the army, I'm not telling you a, a secret here, is not too challenging. Um, and I had the opportunity during during that time, nine months in, in helicopter flight school, to, to do some reading and do some thinking about, about Vietnam that I had just come out of. Um, and I did do some reading about the geopolitics and about the, the politics within the U.S. government, uh, read a couple of good books, David Halberstam, a good, good book, uh, John Paul Van story, um, uh, Bright Shining Lie, um, Best and the Brightest, the Halberstam book. Um, and I learned a lot about Vietnam and realized that that was that that was probably a mistake. Let's just say, you know, um, best of intentions probably um, among most people there. Certainly the soldiers, you know, they and saluted, went over there and did their jobs. Um, uh, but that that was, you know, looking back in the big picture, Iraq. Um, you know something about this in Cohen. Um, um, and I, I remember, along with many people, thinking this was the right thing to do. Um, and many people now look back and say, you know, they probably think of it differently. But I have to confess that uh, uh, I, I supported that in my little, you know, I wasn't in a policy making role at that time. But I did go to Baghdad and I did uh, try to do the best we can on reconstruction. We had, to, you know, a lot of money. The Congress had passed a big bill uh, giving us like $17 billion to, uh, to try to reconstruct and, and repair what damage had been done to the Iraqi economy and infrastructure. And I tried to do that as best I could. Um, um, and again, uh, again, looking back on it, um, Knowing a little more now about uh, the intelligence that we had at the time when that decision was made, you know, maybe we do it differently. Um, but so, but uh, you, know, you kind of, I justified to myself saying, well, here's what I knew um, at the time uh, about Vietnam, about Iraq, um, Afghanistan. I mean, there's, there's, the story hadn't been told there, and we're still, we're still there, and we're still trying. And Zal Khalilzad did a great job. 
Um, his job made it even harder by, by the president reducing the number of troops that he's got there to, to negotiate with. But, but um, Afghanistan was, was, a, was clearer cut. I mean, a, a war of necessity, not of choice. Um, and uh, we stayed there a long time and we tried to do a lot of things. Um, and I was part of doing some of those things that in, in retrospect, you know, it's, it's hard to build democracies. It's hard to uh, uh, do the kind of, of, uh, of, of, of building, uh, of nation building. Uh, it, it, it's hard. Um, it, it's really up to the Afghans. Um, and we've learned, we've learned a lot um, in these. But it is, so, that, so again, one by one, thinking it through, you know, the, the Afghanistan, uh, I, I still am proud of what, uh, of what we had done. And it was, now on Israel-Palestine, again, that's still, you know, we, that's not done. Uh, they're still trying. And what, what I did in that was um, went over there with uh, Jim Wolfenson um, as part of the quartet um, uh, that was trying to get the Israelis and the Palestinians to sit down and agree on how the Israelis would pull out, would withdraw from Gaza and other small parts of the West Bank. Um, and again, that was, you know, I could tell myself and I do tell myself, I'm, I'm proud of that work we did too. Jim Wolfenson did a very good job. And, um, and, and the withdrawal was painful, um, particularly for the Israelis, um, but it happened and, uh, and, and uh, didn't, in the end, it, it, we still have this big problem, uh, but nonetheless, we, we're, we're, working, we're working in the right direction on, on that. Um, so I, I, I guess it's, um, and certainly, certainly on Ukraine, I'm, I'm very pleased with what we're doing in Ukraine, and, and I think we can, Ukraine can succeed. Um, so I look back, yeah, you know, didn't do, you know, <laughs> Vietnam was not a success, Iraq is not a success, Afghanistan is not yet a success, um, uh, Ukraine is on the right track, but it's, it, it, it's hard, uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, Syria, not looking so good, Tunisia, there's still hope, I, I, am, am, I do have hope for Tunisia, so, you know, you know, uh, batting averages, you know, probably in the low 200s here, but the, the uh, you know, I, one of the things I always admired about my State Department, uh, my career colleagues in the State Department when I was there was um, their optimism and their willingness to persist and their understanding, which I think is not always shared um, as widely as it might be, that there are a lot of things where, you know, it's, uh, you keep on rolling the stone up the hill and the stone will roll down the hill. But, uh, but you, you roll it up again and, and you just keep on trying and you persevere and these things never, never quite come to an end. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, can frequently disappoint politicians who haven't thought much about foreign policy and publics who don't spend much time reading about it or, or, or learning about it. Um, let me ask, uh, I'm gonna ask just one or two more questions then uh, open it up. Uh, by the way, Dan, I assume you're out there. Uh, if you put something in the Q and A, I'll uh, give you, uh, I'll, I'll give you the first shot because uh, if it weren't for you, Ambassador Taylor wouldn't be here with us. Thank you, Dan. Um, and Dan always asks hard questions. Uh, oh, so Dan! I, I, Dan! Dan is terrific. He's yes. also he's also a great moderator. I have no idea why I'm doing this actually, <laughs> uh, and he's very cunning actually. Um, so let me ask a question very bluntly, and if, if you need to, because of your position, you need to soften it, feel free. How much damage has the Trump administration done to American foreign policy? I think the, uh, I think the respect for the United States um, as, a, as an international leader has taken a real hit over the last four years. Um, I was just on a, on a call um, with a lot of German colleagues and the topic of this conversation was, was uh, this pipeline, this Nord Stream 2 pipeline coming from Russia to Germany, bypassing Ukraine. Um, and it's a, big, it's a big controversy between uh, the United States and Germany. The United States wants to stop this pipeline. Germany, of course, wants to keep. But in the, in the course of that conversation, um, the Germans were pretty frank um, uh, about the exact question that you asked, Dean Cohen. That is, um, they said, you know, 
we're, we're pleased that there's going to be a new administration um, in town, but um, our confidence is shake, has been shaken. I mean, our faith in the leadership that you all provided, we didn't always like it, said the Germans, and, you know, the Europeans are all, you know, they, you know, they don't always take, you know, not always pleased about, but they, but they like for us to be there, and they like for us to, to, to engage, and they like for us to engage in a respectful way that, that, that recognizes that we're not always right, and they're not always wrong, but there's, but they didn't have that um, over the past four years. So, so they said, very frankly, um, that it's going to be difficult for a new administration to regain that, to regain that trust, to regain that respect, um, regain that influence um, that, uh, that we had. I think we can. Um, I, think, I think we can do that. I take your point about optimism, um, but, I, I, uh, but, it, but it's not going to be as easy as it, as it would have. Do you think that that, um, and this is something I often wonder about, um, you know, I mean, our reputation has taken hard knocks before. I mean, you know, I, you know, as a veteran of the Bush administration, I got plenty of uh, finger wagging uh, talks about, you know, you fools, you knaves, we can never trust you again. Um, you know, I'm sure your predecessors, you know, while you were off fighting in the jungles of Vietnam, were getting plenty of fingers in the chest uh, about, about that as well. So do you think it's, it is the nature of international affairs um, or, or the nature of the United States that people will always be saying, okay, the Americans this time, they've just, they've just blown it completely. We, we just, they just can't lead. We, we can't trust them to lead. Or, or do you think there's something different this time? So I think they want us to lead. They won't say that necessarily. And they may not even want us, they may, that may not be a perfectly accurate statement that they may not want us to actually lead, but they do want us to be engaged and exercise some leadership and give some ideas and bring some resources. And we do have resources, uh, both economic and military and diplomatic and uh, political reasons. We can be part of solutions and the Europeans, but not just the Europeans, the Ukrainians uh, want this, they're Europe Europeans, but the, um, but the, you know, the Japanese and the Australians and the Indians and, you know, um, they, they do look to us um, and they've been disappointed um, at, at the kind of blatant America first kind of, uh, kind of rhetoric and actions uh, and the denigration of allies and, and the, uh, the, the, admiration even for for dictators I mean, this, uh, that has shaken them I, I again part of your question I think was uh, is that permanent no I, I don't think it's permanent I don't think it at all and I think that they they look at elections and they're glad to see that they, but they're worried they're worried about uh, that the United States could elect a person who ha had so little respect for alliances um, and so little respect for allies um, that, uh, you know, who's to say that that wouldn't happen again. Uh, so I, we have a lot of rebuilding to do. We've got a lot of rebuilding. To do. Okay, great. Well, I could, uh, I, you know, I'm very tempted to just monopolize this, but I am aware that there are over a hundred people watching us and they actually want to get involved too. So let's move to that. Uh, I promised Dan the first crack at you. Uh, in addition to some pleasantries, he uh, says, uh, let me ask this. Trump has tried to kill the two-state solution for Israel and Palestine. Has he succeeded? What are the alternatives? So Dan, it's great to, great to hear from you. And as always, uh, you know, hard, hard questions. Um, I don't think so. I think that, uh, you know, the move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem um, with the embassy, you know, symbolic problem, um, that doesn't yet preclude uh, Palestinians having some part of Jerusalem as their capital. Um, the relations between Israel and Arab states, good. You know, that, I, I think that's actually a positive uh, uh, step. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it uh, precludes um, uh, a two-state solution. Um, I've thought 
not a lot. Dan's probably thought a lot more than I have about this, the alternatives to a two-state solution. Um, and, but the degree, I don't see one. I still, and maybe it's a lack of imagination, but uh, uh, two peoples um, on that small part of land, a small part of land between those two, uh, the river and the sea, Two people, you know, if they can have some kind of a of a of a of a nation, uh, some kind of a state, uh, each of them with their capital in parts of Jerusalem, I still think that is that is there. Now, that two state solution for what decade? I mean, again, Dean Cohen, you will know better than I, and and Dan will as well. Um, has but two state solution has been pronounced dead or almost dead for a long time, um, and it's but I. I will be interested to see how the, the new administration addresses that, but on my bet is that we've not given up on the on two state solution. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I could give my views, but that's not what- I would love to hear your views. I would love to, just, just give, me, give a short view of that. Um, I think if it's not dead, it's close to dead. And um, for a whole bunch of reasons. I, I think one of the things that happened is, I think the Israeli side kind of lost any belief that it could be made to work. Um, I also think that the larger change in the Middle East is this, uh, you know, I, I, you can look at these uh, peace agreements with UAE as, okay, this is great. So this means the general situation is changing in a way that's helpful. Actually, what I think it is, it's part of this, you know, what's a geopolitical transformation of the Middle East, where you now have a coalition of Gulf states, Israel, Egypt, against Iran and Turkey, uh, with the Russians playing this very murky role in the middle. And that's, that I think is the new dynamic. And I think the and I'm, I say this as an observer, not as, I mean, if it were up to me, I'd prefer two state solutions. This is not about preference. I, I you know, one of the problems in the Middle East, I think is um, we, it's so easy to, to confuse what we would like to see happen with what we think is actually happening. And you got to just kind of continually force yourself to be coldly analytic about it. Um, one of the biggest things for, for me is there, there were ways in which uh, not all, but large elements of the Arab support for the Palestinian cause were kind of a sham or, you know, pretext or just not something or something that was you did uh, for domestic reasons, but the governments were not particularly serious about. I mean, I got a long lecture once from your, our mutual friend, Dave Welch, uh, along those lines when I was uh, at State working with him. And I think that that has really now changed. Uh, where, you know, you have Arab countries which aren't even going to pretend very much anymore uh, to be particularly engaged in the Palestinian issue. And, and that in turn will, will affect the diplomacy of this. Now, like I said, that doesn't make me happy because I think the, the long run demographic issues that uh, the Israelis will face and that the Israelis and Palestinians will, will face with each other are um, pretty serious. And I guess the last thing I would say is if there's one thing we can take away from the last 20 years or so, it's that this is just no longer the most important issue in, in the region. It's, you know, the cohesion of fragile societies. It, you know, it is Iran and Turkey. Uh, it's the Arab Spring, which, you know, I'd like you to talk more about. Um, and, and so we, we, we still have a bit of a default to looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as the most important thing in the Middle East. It's to my mind, it's like the third or fourth or fifth most important thing in the Middle East. It's other stuff. So, sorry, that that's kind of my. I don't know if you have a reaction to that. Um, no, I, I, your last point I think is is right. Um, uh, it has gone down in salience, um, uh, but I don't think that necessarily changes the dynamic on the ground. Yeah. The, the, but uh, we'll, you're right. There are, there are these there are these big big. Uh, moves uh, that are going in particular on Iran. But there again, you know, the, the, a new administration may have a different view on, uh, on... They may very well. I agree. Okay, let me... Um, so a whole bunch of other questions. I'm going to... Some of these I'm going to kind of pull together because several people ask different versions of the same thing. First, um, what's your basic assessment of where Ukraine is now? 
And what's the best American policy towards Ukraine right, right now? I think Ukraine faces two big challenges. Um, uh, uh, one's internal, one's external. The, the internal one is uh, uh, that there are a, a number, a, you know, a handful of uh, very large businessmen, and they're all men, um, uh, known as oligarchs, some of whom um, are corrupt. Not all, but some of whom are corrupt. And uh, these oligarchs um, uh, have great resources, and they have resources across a range of, of economic sectors. But in particular, they've got TV channels. Um, and so they are able um, to influence in ways that I couldn't understand, that probably most Americans can't understand. They get they really incredible influence all of them. Uh, uh, and they are having a very bad effect on, on this government. This government, so President Zelensky's government, um, and he's gone through several governments, several prime ministers, uh, but he ran on and was elected by 73% of Ukrainians um, uh, a campaign to address these two issues, the internal and external. And the internal is corruption, in particular from the oligarchs, uh, the external one, of course, is Putin um, and, the, and the, the challenge of, of annexation of Crimea and, and uh, continued fighting um, in, in Donbass. Um, so where is Ukraine right now? Ukraine is, is um, still in the throes of this battle with oligarchs. Um, the, the, the support for Zelensky's election uh, based on a commitment to clean up uh, and to go against uh, the and, uh, and to reduce the power of these oligarchs um, is very strong, um, and and the, and the people have shown this on a couple of occasions. You know they've had, you know they stood out in the cold in the um, in two thousand four two thousand five in order to get their, their election uh, results. Uh, uh, that they were stolen and they wanted to redo it and they got that. And the same thing in, in 2014, where they st again stood out in the cold um, and wanted to be sure that the, that, the, that the move toward Europe was gone and that the corrupt people were out. So the, the Ukrainian people are, are strongly committed to uh, anti-corruption uh, and they're strongly committed now um, to defending themselves against the Russians. So the, so the first is the anti-corruption uh, uh, work that they need to do. And, and just, just one little vignette right now uh, describes this. So there's a constitutional court in Ukraine. And this constitutional court is, is, is controlled. The judge, several of the judges, you know, maybe like nine of the 17 judges are controlled by a couple of these different oligarchs, some of whom are uh, connected to the Russians um, or to the very pro-Russian uh, oligarch uh, that is there. Um, and this constitutional court has struck down the, the, the new institutions, the high anti-corruption court, the special anti-corruption prosecutor, um, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, NABU. Um, it has taken away the, 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 uh, the structure that had been put in place to fight corruption which is what in that those those institutions were put in place in the previous administration and Zelensky um, strengthened them. So there, there's that issue. Um, uh, the other issue is, of course, um, Putin and the Kremlin's desire to control Ukraine without occupying it. I mean, they just want to uh, be sure that Ukraine is not a success. The, Ukraine, the Russians, oddly, don't want a successful neighbor. They, they, they don't want to see a prosperous neighbor. They would rather have a poor, disorganized, politically divided neighbor. Um, and so they, that's what the Russians are doing at this point. And here is where we, and the answer to the second part of your question about what we should be doing about it, we should be supporting Ukraine's effort to defend itself against the Russians. Um, we should be supportive of Ukrainian efforts to clean up the corruption and the, and the, and the oligarch problems. Turns out that there are a couple of the oligarchs are a little worried about being uh, uh, indicted um, uh, in this country, in the United States. And that's something we can do to help. Uh, and they should be 
there. They should be uh, worried because they've, they've broken our law. Um, so, so there are those kinds of things that we can do to help. And why? Because Ukraine's on the front line. And Ukraine is on the front line, and we should support them being on the front line. They're on the front line with the Russian attack on the West. You know, the, the Russians have attacked the Ukrainians on their border militarily. But even before that, they attacked their, their elections. The Russians have meddled in Ukrainian elections over and over. And then, then Ukrainians don't stop th the, the Russians don't stop there with the Ukrainians. The Russians meddle in, in European elections and referenda. Um, and then, as we know, uh, the Russians in interfere in our election in 2016 um, um, to amazing effect. Um, so, so, th so the Ukrainians are on the front line. Um, they are the first line of defense um, against that. So they are worthy of support. They, they, are, they share our values. They share European values. Uh, they would like to join the European Union. They'd like to join NATO. Um, um, and, and that's their decision in the first instance to apply. It's not our decision to tell them yes or no on that until they apply. Um, but but, but that, that support for a country and a people um, trying to uh, become a normal European country and to defend themselves and, and exert their sovereignty against, against the Russians. So we ought to support them. So, so you, know, in, you uh, made a passing reference to Crimea. Should it be an objective of American policy to restore Crimea to Ukrainian control? I think the answer is yes. I think the answer is yes. Here's why. Um, um, in, in 1991, 1992, when, when the Soviet Union uh, imploded, there could have been, there could have been a lot, there, there were some, but there, there could have been great chaos and, and great bloodshed um, over borders. And, and wisely, um, the international community, I think Secretary Baker had a lot to do with this, um, but also you give credit to the, the Soviets and then, and then the Russians and then the Ukrainian leaders who all decided that the borders would not be changed, that the borders of the Soviet Union would be the borders of these 12, 15 new, new countries, uh, 15 because of the three Baltic states. Um, uh, and, and that was a good decision. And it turns out, it just turns out that the borders of Ukraine uh, in 1991 included Crimea and had and since 1954. Um, uh, so, so, the, so the sovereignty of a nation and sovereignty of nations is an important principle that we ought to defend. Um, the Russians um, invaded um, Crimea with the first the little green men, which then they acknowledged were Russian soldiers. Um, and they had uh, a referendum at the point of a gun. Uh, so people said they, you know, they, they were the, the Ukrainians and, and uh, Crimean Tatars and, and for Russians, the, citizens, the people in Crimea were, said, were asked, you want to be part of Russia or not? And, and you better get the right answer because I'm going to shoot you if you get the wrong answer. Almost literally. Um, so they voted 97% uh, to, uh, to uh, totally illegitimate. Um, and the illegitimate annexation of a, of, an, of, an, of a sovereign nation's territory is not consistent with the, with the principles of, uh, of, of sovereignty and, and sanctity of borders. So if we want to reestablish uh, some rules-based order um, uh, that the Russians violated in 2014 with that invasion, if we want to reestablish that, then we have to allow uh, normal processes. Now, now, let me. So, so two other points on on Crimea. Um, one is, um, we don't recognize the Russian annexation of uh, of Crimea, um, and we didn't recognize the Soviet annexation of the Baltic states in World War II, um, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, we all throughout the whole Cold War, we had this uh, fiction. Um, actually, that uh, they were still somehow independent, or we didn't, or we didn't, or but we didn't recognize the Soviet annexation, and here they are. You know, the they they now they're proud members of the European Union, proud members of NATO. Uh, they are free, and and so we say to the Ukrainians uh, who are concerned about Crimea that uh, we don't recognize. And Secretary Pompeo, to his credit, about two two years ago, um, 
made it very clear in a, in a declaration that the United States policy um, would be never, never to recognize the Russian annexation and that maybe like the Baltics, you know, they will eventually uh, come back. Now, that said, last point on Crimea, if there at some point um, were to be a, a ref an internationally recognized and observed and agreed with the Ukrainian government in Kiev that there would be a, a, a real referendum, okay, you know, the, um, it may well be that they decide, who knows which way they decide at that time, but, uh, but that wasn't the case. They didn't have it. So long answer, sorry, but, but mm -hmm. Crimea is Ukraine. Fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm bantering around the Q&A. This is um, from Elias Howard. And again, I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, well, actually, I'll read the last sentences uh, verbatim. From your experience immediately after the end of the Cold War up through the Ukraine crisis, did we do enough in our foreign policy to try to reintegrate, to reintegrate and normalize Russia, presumably at the end of the Cold War? I mean, there, there is, you know, one argument that's made is, well, you know, at some level, uh, the, the course that Russia took is our fault. We didn't uh, uh, make a, an adequate effort to bring them in. Of course, there's a, a vehement argument about NATO expansion. My, uh, my former colleague, Mike Mandelbaum, here at SICE was, uh, I think, particularly eloquent and forceful in saying this is a terrible idea. Meanwhile, the dean at the time said it's great. I, Paul Wolfowitz said it's a great idea. It's, it's sort of a typical situation where the professor just are uh, giving the deans a difficult time of just about everything. Um, uh, <laughs> where, where, what, how do you think about that in retrospect? So two ways. Um, one on the integration of Russia. Um, so, um, so in, in, um, in 1987, um, I was at the U.S. mission to NATO. And so I was there at the end of the Cold War. Now, of course, we didn't know it was the end of the Cold War. And while, we were, while I was there in 87, 88, 89, um, we were doing war games and exercises and, and strategic planning on how we could defend Europe from the Soviet tanks coming across the, the North European plain. Um, and we were wondering how long we could last before we had to think about nuclear weapons. Um, so this was, this, you know, this was the end of the Cold War. This was full Cold War. Um, but, and I was there, I was in, 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 uh, in Brussels uh, at US NATO when the wall fell. Um, and then uh, two years later, uh, at the end of 91, I was still there um, when the Soviet Union imploded. I mean, probably all who were alive at that time uh, will, will remember uh, those, those kind of things. And there was great jubilation, everybody will remember this. And the Congress was so supportive of of, and, and, and voted uh, a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars every year for the United States and its various organizations uh, to support the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Kazakhs and all of these former Soviet states in their attempt um, to move toward a market economy from a, a centrally planned economy and toward democracy from a, from their, from their uh, Marxist time, the Soviet time, Soviet governance. Um, and, and, so, and I uh, was, Rich Armitage, whom we uh, mentioned earlier, was the first coordinator of all that assistance. Um, and I was one of the later coordinators of all that assistance. Um, uh, and, and, and we tried hard, here again, this is, this is another of my failures. Uh, uh, we, we, try, we tried hard. Um, uh, economically, we, we have people from the Treasury Department that worked with the, with the Russians when they were trying to privatize, and Dan Freed will remember working with the Poles when they were going through their, you know, uh, uh, dramatic uh, move over to Big Bang of, of, of economic reform. So we, we did a lot of work and spent a lot of money and spent a lot of time trying to do that. And, and, uh, and, we, and you know, there was, there was responsiveness on the Russian side. And there was some hope uh, that they would move all the way through probably, you know, um, even when Putin started his, his uh, presidency in the early 2000s, there was some hope that there was even talk, it gets into the, my second point about NATO, there was even talk uh, about Russia joining NATO. There was, and, and there was discussion of that. Uh, we're not, <laughs> 
as much as we would like to think we can affect all, all the directions of, uh, of, of Russia and its democracy and, and economy or governance and economy, we, we, we don't. We're a small part of that. And they, they, they decide uh, how they're going to do it. They did decide how, how they were going to organize. Um, we gave them some support, but that, that was, that was the, their, their decision. And um, the same thing on the, 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 eastern, the, the countries in Eastern Europe um, and Central Europe. Um, and so the Czech Republic, uh, Czechoslovakia, and Czech Republic, um, uh, Poland, um, Hungary, um, these countries, um, when the Soviet Union disappeared, were very eager uh, to join NATO. They were very concerned about their, they knew what it's like to be under Soviet rule, and they did not want to have that happen again. They, and they were so small and, and you know, fairly weak compared to the Russians um, that they needed, they needed security. They needed some, some defensive alliance, defensive alliance. Um, and so they applied. I mean, this is not us kind of pulling them in. Um, this was the, their application, the Eastern Europeans, and that continued. Um, so I come down on the on the, on the side that uh, you know, you know, we have a success, had a successful um, military alliance, security alliance, and political alliance to some degree, um, and and it was evident to these newly independent states and newly newly uh, freed satellites um, that this security was it was important, and that was the this collective security was was uh, was 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 valuable and powerful. And they wanted to be part of it, um, and we didn't say no. Um, we didn't say no. So, um, you know, respect the people who are making the decision, whether they be the Russians on how they want to organize their economy or the, the Russians, uh, if they want to support Putin and his, his subsequent uh, move toward, uh, to, toward uh, autocratic rule. Um, that's, there's a limit to how much, there's a very low limit to how much we can, uh, we we can do. So I'm going to ask one last question because I, I believe in giving people uh, 10 minutes break, but, but, you know, before the next hour and uh, when we're in Zoom world, and I know there are six o'clock classes. Uh, so I'll do one question, then I'll just say a few closing remarks. Uh, this is from Katie Henderson. How has your experience as an ambassador to foreign countries influenced your views on the United States and its domestic politics? I think that's a wonderful question. It is a wonderful question. Um, I will will say, um, and I, I will say that I have, over the past year, over the past really six months, uh, I have shifted focus. I mean, I've, I've begun to focus on, on US domestic social problems that I hadn't focused on before. Um, uh, and it's in answer to Katie's question, um, the, the respect for other countries, people, citizens, um, is what I have learned. Um, uh, and we can help, um, but in the end, it is, uh, it's the responsibility of those individuals, but also those, those nations uh, to chart their, their own course. So for us and uh, in the US domestic policy, and I wanna give a shout out to Dan Serwer's son, um, who has been brilliant in his analysis, uh, uh, Adam Serwer, of, uh, of, of this very issue. Is I've learned a lot from Adam um, about this. And it's respect for people. It is just respect for individuals, respect for groups, it's respect for, for people, um, um, respect for people. Uh, and, and they can decide um, what, is, what is best for them and, and have to be given the opportunity to, to do that. So, there's a, a lot we can learn from abroad, but but we do have to we do have to recognize uh, our own problems, and we've got them, um, uh, and we 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 have to admit that to our our foreign allies and our foreign friends that uh, we've got problems, um, and and, uh, and and we have to work on them here. Yeah. Well, I I couldn't agree with you more. This has been a wonderful conversation. I want to I want to thank you not just for being enlightening about. Uh, Ukraine, the Middle East, uh, Russia. Uh, but I uh, think one of the gifts you've given, um, particularly our students here at SAIS, 
is an example of how to be um, have a career in public service that is rich and fulfilling, even if it's not always crowned with uh, immediate success. <laughs> right. But above all, one that is a, a career animated by passion and integrity. And uh, you know, the country owes you a debt. And uh, I uh, I want to thank you for this. And I'm looking forward to having you back at size. This is uh, this was terrific. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.